the universal tibial nail and synrheme. The tibia is fixed in the vice so that the pseudarthrosis is between the two clamps. In the clinic, the patient is placed in the supine position on the operating table. The patient must be well cushioned to avoid nerve and vessel lesions from poor positioning. To open the medullary canal, the cannulated cutter with the protection sleeve, the 4 mm centering pin, and the universal chuck with T-handle are needed. The centering pin is fitted into the universal chuck with T-handle. The correct insertion site in the continuation of the central axis of the medullary canal is identified on the tibial head between the attachment of the patellar ligament and the tibial plateau just below its anterior edge. To help orientation, an intramedullary nail can be placed on the anterior edge of the tibia. The centering pin has to be inserted so that it's parallel to the proximal nail curvature. The pin is advanced with the universal chuck with T-handle until the tip of the pin is in the medullary canal. Then the universal chuck with T-handle is removed. The protection sleeve is slid over the cannulated cutter. If the cannulated cutter is used without the protection sleeve, it's very easy to injure the patellar ligament. This damage is avoided by using the protection sleeve. For demonstration purposes, the protection sleeve will not be used here. The opening to the medullary canal can now be cut by rotary movements. After removing the cannulated cutter and the centering pin, the 2.5 mm synream reaming rod, which has an olive at one end, is inserted. The reaming rod is carefully pushed into the medullary canal with the holding forceps or the T-handle. As is often the case with a hypertrophic pseudarthrosis in practice, the fracture zone on this bone model cannot be penetrated because of the sclerosed medullary canal, so the reaming rod is removed. The sclerosed medullary canal must first be opened with the hand reamers. In practice, hand reamers with diameters of 6 to 8 millimeters are available. After the medullary canal has been opened, the reaming rod is again pushed into the canal. In the clinic, passage through the fracture zone and the correct position of the nail are verified in two planes with the image intensifier. The reaming instruments consist of a flexible shaft and a set of reamer heads. Only reamers with sharp, undamaged cutting edges should be used. Reamers like this one, with damaged or blunt edges, should not be used, but replaced immediately, since they have a negative effect on the reaming procedure. In the clinic, reamer heads of 8.5 to 19 millimeters are available. For the exercise, reamer heads from 8.5 to 12 millimeters will be used. Because an 11 millimeter diameter nail is needed for this exercise, the canal will be reamed up to 12 millimeters. For the first reaming, the 8.5 mm reamer head must be used. The shaft can be easily connected to the reamer head by a click-on mechanism. The compact air drive with the attachment for medullary reaming is now employed. By pulling back the ring on the quick coupling, the attachment is opened. The flexible shaft can now be inserted. The universal drill with the angular drive unit could be used instead for the reaming procedure. 
The flexible shaft is guided over the reaming rod. During the reaming process, the reaming rod is held precisely in the axis of the tibial shaft by the assistant, using the holding forceps to prevent the rod from rotating and the reamer from jamming. The reamer is pushed into the opening of the medullary canal without rotation. In practice, the soft tissues are protected during the reaming by the tissue protector. Reaming is done using the highest drive speed with slight and even pressure moving the drive back and forth. This movement frees the reamer from bone material and prevents it from jamming against the reaming rod. When the reamer is removed, the reaming rod must be held in position by the assistant to prevent it being pulled out. Should the reamer become jammed during the reaming, it must be removed manually. To do this, the drive must be disconnected from the flexible shaft. The holding forceps is mounted on the reaming rod. With small blows of the hammer against the forceps, the jammed reamer can be withdrawn from the medullary canal by means of the olive on the reaming rod. Before continuing, the reaming rod is reinserted and its position verified. Alternatively, the jammed reamer can be removed by mounting the T-handle with quick coupling, turning the flexible shaft anti-clockwise, and pulling the shaft back. A lot of debris is produced with the pseudarthrosis in artificial bone. It can be knocked out. In the clinic, the reamer head is removed by placing it in the slot of the removing tool for reamers and pulling back the flexible shaft. The reamer and shaft are guided into the medullary canal over the reaming rod. Reaming is continued in 0.5 mm steps until a diameter of 12 mm is reached, that is 1 mm larger than the diameter of the nail to be used. The required length of the nail is now determined. A second reaming rod is placed parallel to the inserted rod and the exposed end marked on the second reaming rod with the holding forceps. As both rods are the same length, the protruding part of the second rod corresponds to the length of the rod lying in the medullary canal, so it shows the length of the nail. The next steps require the appropriate insertion handle and a 315 mm nail with an 11 mm diameter. The keystone slot of the nail allows evenly transmitted tension over the entire length of the fully slotted nail. Also needed are the conical threaded bolt, the knurled nut, the combination wrench, and the pin wrench. The curved driving piece is firmly secured with the socket wrench. The nail is inserted over the reaming rod. For the first few centimeters into the medullary canal, insertion is by hand. The appropriate insertion handle, the conical threaded bolt, and the knurled nut are assembled. Together they're slid over the reaming rod and placed on the nail. Care must be taken to ensure that the insertion handle has properly engaged in the nail. The threaded bolt is screwed in by hand and then tightened with the combination wrench. The knurled nut is tightened with the pin wrench so that the insertion handle cannot loosen during introduction. The curved driving piece with driving head is screwed on manually. Then the driving piece is tightened with the socket wrench. This curved driving piece is designed to balance out the proximal nail curvature and permit the correct axial force transfer during insertion. The nail is now introduced with careful blows of the hammer. It's important that the nail advances farther into the tibia with every blow. The nail is inserted until it's flush with the insertion site. 
in the clinic, passage through the fracture zone and the final position of the nail have to be verified in two planes on the image intensifier. When the nail has been positioned correctly, the curved driving piece can be taken off and the reaming rod removed. Although in practice, indications for proximal locking depend on the location of the pseudarthrosis, proximal locking is carried out for the purpose of this exercise. The insertion handle acts as an aiming device when placing the locking bolts. There are three types of locking. Distal static, dynamic in the middle, and proximal static. The appropriate option can be selected. The 8 mm protection sleeve with trocar is advanced as far as the bone. It is impacted, and the trocar is replaced by the 4.5 mm drill sleeve. The attachment for medullary reaming is replaced by the quick coupling, the special drill bit with 4 mm drill diameter and 4.5 mm core diameter is inserted. Both cortices are drilled. The drill sleeve is removed. The length is measured. For the locking bolts, at least two millimeters should be added to the measured length. Tapping is not necessary. The locking bolt is inserted. The technique is the same for the other locking options. Loosening the knurled nut by a quarter turn prevents the insertion handle from disengaging from the nail. The conical threaded bolt is unscrewed with the combination wrench. The nail is now proximally locked with two bolts. These bolts can gain sufficient purchase in the far cortex only if the tips protrude. The locking options are demonstrated again on an open model. This model shows proximal static and dynamic locking. Three months after nailing, the tibia was healed. The universal tibial nail is removed as follows. The conical threaded bolt is screwed into the nail thread. It is tightened with the socket wrench. The knurled nut is tightened with the pin wrench. The locking bolts are removed. If a locking bolt cannot be easily taken out with the ordinary screwdriver when the implant is removed or during replacement, it helps to mount a holding sleeve on the screwdriver. The cannulated guide rod is screwed onto the thread of the conical bolt. The ram is slid onto the cannulated guide rod. The flexible grip, which will as a counterplate for the ram when extracting the nail is screwed on. The universal tibial nail can now be removed with careful blows of the ram.